All right, we're going to take a look today at uh, antimatter, which sounds like uh, science fiction, but uh, actually you'll come to see how it's used uh, every day in hospitals in what's called a PET scan or positron emission tomography. Um, so first, a little bit about uh, matter and antimatter. Um, you're probably familiar with the parts of an atom. Um, so here's a helium atom. And inside the atom, we have uh, protons here. So here's a proton. And the proton has a charge of one and a mass number of one. So we tend to write protons like this, either one, one, or the lowercase p. Or you might remember that it's actually just a hydrogen uh, nucleus. So you can write a proton like that. Uh, these guys here are neutrons. Um, they have no charge, so that's a neutron. They don't have any charge, um, so charge is zero. They have a mass number of one. We tend to write them like this. Um, and then buzzing around here on the outside, we've made a neutral atom here. So these are two um, electrons that are cruising around in what's called the 1s orbital. So here's an electron. And you write uh, electrons have charge of minus one and a mass number of zero. Um, so there's an electron. Or um, these are actually called beta particles if you're doing nuclear physics. So you might see them written like this. Now it turns out, you come to believe from kind of uh, high school chem that the world's just kind of made up out of, out of uh, this stuff, um, but it turns out there are more particles than this. Uh, and in fact, uh, every particle um, has a, a pair particle um, that's the antimatter version of matter that you see here. And so the antiparticle for an electron, uh, anti-electron, which is actually has a special name of a positron since it was the first one to be found. So an anti-electron, but we're actually just gonna, always going to call it a positron. It has a special name because, again, it was the first one of these to be found. Um, the way that you would write a positron, well, it's just a, like an electron, only it has a uh, charge of plus one. So you can either just write the one or write plus one, zero, and then E plus, or you might see it as beta plus. Uh, you don't have to write the plus. I just typed it in. You could write it as, uh, say, one, zero, beta plus. Well, where can you find these or where do they come from? Well, what's going to be relevant for us today is we're going to look at uh, these things can be made um, sometimes in a, um, in a nuclear reaction. Um, and so one nuclear reaction that can produce these um, is if you have a, um, a, an isotope of, um, of fluorine. So if you have uh, the decay of fluorine-18... So we'll suppose that we'll suppose that we've got fluorine 18, and so here's here's fluorine. It's element nine. It's fluorine 18. Now it turns out that most of the time, when this is an unstable nucleus, um, most of the time when it decays, and it's about 97 percent of the time, what it does is it decays by emitting one of these positrons, and so what can happen is it will it will kick off a positron, so you have a 1, 0, E plus, and then we can see what the other um, species that must be left behind is. Well, so the char total charge here is, is 9, and so 1 plus mystery number has to be 9, so why this thing has to have a charge of 8. Um, that's going to be an oxygen, and then uh, you have 18 as the mass number of protons plus neutrons, um, 0 here, so this needs to be 18. So you've made a, a positron has come shooting out and you have uh, oxygen 18. Um, this reaction, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, see how this gets used in medicine uh, in a moment. Um, but just for the heck of it, it, as it turns out, about the other like 3% of the time, um, the way that this thing will decay is it will um, do what's called an electron capture. Um, so this would be a beta plus decay positron emission, okay? Um, and then um, the other, this is what's called an electron capture. So the other way that this thing can decay, because again, it's an unstable nucleus, um, what it can do is it can snag an electron. Um, so this is called an electron capture. You could write it as beta um, also. And you can see what the species is that's made. Well, the total charge here will be nine, and then we pulled in an electron, minus one. Um, and so what that's going to do is make a total charge of eight, 
and then likewise on the top, our mass number is gonna be 18. So it's another pathway to make an, um, an oxygen 18, um, but this one is a, a different um, uh, type of reaction called electron capture, or beta capture. Okay, so the point being, if you have this funny isotope of fluorine, it can decay and then spit out and make in the world, introduce into the world one of these particles, a positron. Now where this gets really interesting is if one of these positrons happens to meet an electron, right? So we're gonna take a quick uh, look at what happens if we do that. Oh. Let's suppose we have a positron actually that we've made because by having this fluorine isotope decay. And what we'll do is we'll have that positron meet an electron. So let's look at what happens if we have a positron uh, meet up with an electron. Right, and we'll draw some pictures of it. Here's a little positron, and it's going to join up with or meet an electron. These guys are going to get together, um, and we'll write a little uh, reaction for that. So the positron has a charge of plus one, uh, mass number zero, E plus, or beta plus, uh, plus the electron, which has negative one charge, zero, E minus, or beta minus. And again, what we've got here is a total charge of zero. Um, so we've got to make something with a total charge of zero. And we don't have a mass number. We need something with mass number zero. So total charge zero, mass number zero. Um, what fits the bill is actually a photon, um, but so uh, or so those tend to be written with this symbol gamma for like a, a gamma ray. Now there's a problem with this. This is saying you have a positron and electron get together and make a photon, uh, make light. Unfortunately, that would this would violate momentum because you can't have two things that just kind of come together and then you just fire one thing off in one direction. Um, so it, what you actually end up getting here is a pair of photons, two gamma rays. One goes in one direction, one goes the other direction, right? So you have a, a particle plus a particle makes no particles. You just get light, you get a pair of, a, pair of gamma rays um, that go off in, in uh, opposite directions, okay? So what's interesting with this is you have mass plus mass gives you something that's massless. So this is as pure a conversion of mass into energy as there is. When you get antimatter and matter together, they will annihilate each other and produce, um, produce light in, in, in opposite directions. Um, so these are, again, two gamma rays that head off in, in opposite directions. So a, a quick little story, and then I'll prep you for a little movie clip that I've, um, that I've taken from, uh, from YouTube is uh, the way this ends up getting used in the hospital is you attach that radioactive fluorine that we talked about, um, that we wrote the reaction for, you attach that to a sugar. So again, just for records, I'll put that fluorine reaction back up. So we had fluorine 18, uh, element nine, um, decaying by emitting a positron, one zero E plus plus eight, 18 oxygen. Right, so that's where these that's where this thing comes from in the first place. So here's the deal: you uh, you have a chemist attach radioactive fluorine to a sugar, and you purposefully put it into a patient. All right, and then that sugar goes throughout their body. But so you have this radioactive sugar that you've purposefully given to a patient, goes all over the body. That sugar uh, cancer cells will tend to gobble the sugar at a greater rate than other cells. So you'll get a greater concentration of the, the sugar, say, where there's like cancer cells. What will happen is that radioactive fluorine in the sugar will, will make a positron in your body. It will decay and make a positron. Well, that positron doesn't have to go very far to find an electron in your body. There's plenty of them, right? So what will happen is the, elect the positron will meet an electron in your body and then annihilate and zing, you get a pair of gammas that go in, in different directions. Well, so you have the patients laid out on the slab and the positrons and electrons are meeting and annihilating each other and shooting out a pair of gammas. And what you can do is detect those gammas and figure out where the, where the gamma rays came from. Um, and that actually tells you where the sugar was being used, all right? 
So um, I wanted to tell you that story first, but I'll show you here in a second a more uh, effective animation um, that shows that process. But again, just so you know what to look for in the animation, patient's gonna be given some, a patient with possible cancer will, that we want to image is gonna be given a radioactive sugar. Sugar's gonna go throughout the body, um, collect preferentially in certain places that use sugar a lot, the brain, the heart, and then in particular, cancer cells. And then what you do is you look for where these gammas are coming from when they're produced and uh, wherever the sugar collects, well, you can get a little bit of contrast in the image around, um, say, where a cancer cell is. Um, so I'll show you a little video clip about that. So here is this uh, patient who may or may not have uh, some kind of a cancer. And what's happening here is the patient is being given the radioactive sugar, the sugar with the fluorine isotope that's attached to the uh, type of glucose with fluorine attached. And the sugar goes throughout the body, right? It's carried around everywhere in the bloodstream. Uh, and so we have to wait a bit for the um, sugar to collect in tissues. As you can see, as it says down there, the tissues that tend to gobble the sugar, uh, you know, it collects at a greater um, concentration in those tissues. So the little green ball is supposed to be the radioactive fluorine. And the hexagons there are the um, sugar. There it decays, it made a positron. That positron will have an easy time finding an electron in your body. And there's the two gammas, say, going in the opposite directions. And so what's done is your body is put in this ring of detectors. And then um, from the detectors, uh, an image is, is able to be constructed that shows where the counts, where the gamma rays are coming from. Um, so there's this Australian uh, agency that's made this video. Um, one thing that's really fascinating with this, if you stop and think about the chain of events that's happened here, is you needed, the, you needed a chemist to um, make the radioactive sugar in the, in the first place. Um, so you needed that to happen. You need that to get to the, um, the hospital where doctors who know how much radioactive sugar you need to be given can uh, properly dose it. Um, you need people who know how long it, that you should wait, how long it takes for the sugar to get around in your body um, um, before the, um, the scan can be made. And then you need people who know how to operate the MRI. And then, of course, you need radiologists who know how to read the MRI. Um, so this is just a spectacular amount of collaboration between um, all kinds of scientists. Um, and so that is how antimatter is used in PET scans in the hospital.